I'm sure there'll be some laughing in House of Gucci. I am worried. Child I do have every to say. Trailer, every new trailer <laughs> gives a new laugh for me. I cannot wait. Girl, I, I mean, no, I, I said this. She's making me long for the subtlety of Waluigi. Um, <laughs> I don't exactly ethical, but I'm <laughs> what is that? She, She's deep in the spaghetti, okay? I cannot wait. <laughs> Oh my god, that, that accent, my eyes flew out. Anyway. <laughs> She's Miss Boyardee, okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Keep It, Cricket Media show about pop culture and politics and what happens when they smack into each other at an alarming speed. I'm your host, Ira Madison III, I'm a television writer and Fallout Boy fan. I'm Louis Fertel, I'm a TV writer and Jane Fonda historian. And I'm Aida Osman, I'm a TV writer and alleged comedian. Let's get into it. I've been told the supply chain is making our consumption of goods difficult. Uh, I only half understand that joke. Uh, so the only thing we have to consume is TV and movies. So what have we been watching? Sylvia, we'll let you go first as our lovely guest. What have you been watching? What should the girls, you know, be tuning into? But I feel like I have such a range. Like, I think, like, the, the shows I'm going to mention are really on, like, opposite ends of my interest spectrum. Um, I want to start with Succession because I watched that the most recently this Sunday. And, White excellence. Um, White excellence Caucasian is what I refer to it Caucasian chaos as. is what I call it. <laughs> Caucasian chaos. Caucasian chaos, yeah. Wealthy, <laughs> one percenters, acting, running amok. And it's just... Such a hilarious glimpse into a world I will never have access to, but I'll often wonder, like, can they be as dumb as it seems when they present themselves? And it's like, yes. This season, the family's kind of just separating because Kendall is trying to take down his dad, and it's a lot of toxic family behavior. Like, this is just like anything that I could imagine happening at the Thanksgiving table, like, times a thousand, and it's just been really fun to see um the power dynamics between him and his siblings and their dad who everybody seems to be afraid of and like um if the fbi and the government are gonna come in and take down you know for all these things and i'm like i i don't know the whole time i watched it i just felt like Kendall is just gr- like it was fun at first to watch him blow things up and see what's happening. But I think by this episode, like episode three, which ha- aired this Sunday, it's starting to feel like a manic episode. It's starting to make me wonder, like, is it coke? Like, I don't really know if Kendall really knows what's what's leading where he's going. He's just like a tornado. He needs some help. <laughs> he needs some help because he seems we thought I thought he had a noble mission by like. Well, exposing, you know, the the rape culture of his father's company with the whole cruise line thing. and But it's turned into just this egotistical tornado running through New York about him just, you know, loving to see his bad tweets and his good tweets and wanting to get on the nightly show with shout out to Z-Way popped up as like the nightly show host this episode. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, we we get two black people this season, not just one. <laughs> so like, it was nice to see her and uh, basically playing a version of herself, I guess. I'm really into trying to figure out who is doing the best strategy to survive what seems to be this downward spiral that the family company is going through. In my heart, I like to root for Shiv just because she's the only woman but like ship also has a lot of issues and she really let the chopper sing on her brother this week roman who is my favorite colkin um (laughs) is is just like i just love his character in general but i don't know i have a lot of feelings what do you guys feel about the show well so i love succession you know i feel what's what's so fun is like i was with some people this weekend i forgot that um Sometimes people actually enjoy the chaos of my Instagram stories. Uh, I mostly do them to amuse myself. And someone pointed out that, like, I had this obsession with putting things to the theme song of Succession, like, a couple years ago. And that's what actually got them to start watching the show. Uh, And I was like, it was in its white excellence phase 
before. But now, season three is very stressful to watch for me. It is. Because uh, it, it, is, it is constantly a lot of switching alliances. And I'm a Kendall Roy fan, but it does feel manic and stressful to watch him. What I think is exciting is having grown up on, like, you know, like, Young and the Restless and stuff like that, which always has, like, family boardroom drama. This one is really turning it on its head in the sense that, like, no one is sort of in the right because, yes, Kendall wants to take down his dad, but it's all for self-serving reasons. So, no, he, it's not like he has a noble cause of wanting to bring everything to light. He just wants power. And I think it really sort of, like, translates, you know, um, sort of the power grabs and things we see in the media um, now, you know? It reminds you of, like, like Mark Zuckerberg and this whole meta stuff, right? You know, it's very much... Um, we want to change the world, you know. We want to represent the world that we're living in. It's like, okay, yeah. but your company, your company is evil, um, right? Or even just down to like that we we did this terrible thing, but let's just change the name and let's do that. Or it's like, who's being paid millions to come up with these very small ideas that aren't really helpful? And that's like what I feel like the curtain is taken down for. And it gives you the idea of like how fucking proud of themselves people are for doing stuff like that like you know someone came up with the name meta and meta. We're, we're like like like, like we're orgasming in a boardroom being like yes meta meta it's, it's the future it. <laughs> this is it no exactly that because they literally had that in this episode where they're trying to rebrand and the guy was like i came up with this phrase and it was something so simple like we see you or we got it and it's like that's that's what you get paid millions of dollars for? Like, please, somebody, give me millions to come up with mediocre ideas. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> My thing about this show is, while I, I watched the entire first season, I felt like I got enough of what the what the show is about, which is to say they're all wretched and like we're into we're into the turmoil and it's going to continue to be turmoil and Kendall's going to continue to have problems and so it's just like I got my fill basically and I know like Holly Hunter appeared and that's like one of my patron saints and I should really care about that but I could be um, persuaded to rejoin because blurbs from Brian Cox's new book just came out and he is Girl. a little bitch. <laughs> Whoa. She, she went in. Have you seen any of these, Sylvia? No. Oh, my God. In the blurbs I've seen, he just picks a bunch of actors and then says how shitty they are. He goes about Johnny Depp. Personable, though, I'm sure he is. Depp is so overblown, so overrated. And then he continues, I mean, Edward Scissorhands, let's face it. If you come on with hands like that and pale, scarred up face makeup, you don't have to do anything. And he didn't. And subsequently, he's done even less. Woof. Guys, you know, <laughs> what? Here's, here, here's what I'll say. Here's what I'll say. If you are if you have an actor who's like in their 70s and maybe didn't quite get their due their entire lives, you hit that person up for an interview because you're going to get the tidbits. You know what I'm saying? This is not th the same thing at all. But like Quincy Jones, he was just waiting around to give us the best stories we've ever heard and, t and call Ringo Starr an asshole. He's definitely giving Quincy Jones. And I... Um... I, I, that's exactly what came to my mind. I think it's like when they get to a certain ages, like, I don't care. I'm about, to, you know, whatever. What are you going to yeah. do to ruin my career at this point? I'm wrapping mm -hmm. it up anyway. I would say that this, the, what's so entertaining about that is that it, it's basically, it seems like his character is him. It, it reminded uh, me of the character. The fearsomeness himself. of the character. Like, yeah. Like, he he's exhibiting the thing that makes the character watchable. So. And I will yeah. offer, you know, what what is best for a show like this, which is very soapy, um, and also a comedy, is that um, if you get into the rhythm of it, that's why you watch it. You know, it's like yes, you've seen sort of like the configurations and where the show's going to go, and there's always going to be new twists that you can't see coming. But also, it's just it's so fucking funny. It's my favorite comedy on TV. To be honest, right. oh, um, okay. and oh. where and where no, it's like gothic veep is what I once yeah. called that. I want yeah, to that's what it, that's oh. truly what it is. Mm -hmm. The insults gothic and the veep. jokes. You know, like someone called someone something linguini the other week. It's just it, it's so damn funny. The quips are so funny, and that is what I tune in for, especially when, as we've talked before on this show, and I think when we were on Michelle Collins's podcast, Lewis, about the fact that you know, like when like. The Ted Lassos and things, you know, where it's like comedy has reverted for sitcoms into just like people being sort of nice to each other and no plot and just pop culture references. It's nice to have like searing 
um, comedy. Oh yeah, bastardliness. Week. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, the thing I loved about Veep. Yeah. Yeah, and I would be really quickly just remiss if I came up here on Keep It and did not acknowledge the final season of Insecure at all, because that is definitely what has my most attention on TV right now as it wraps up. And I really just wanted to come because I I don't know if I've ever heard you say this or not, but. Are you Lawrence Hive or are you like Team Issa and everybody else end up single at the end of the series as it wraps up? I'm Team Issa because I would actually say that like I, um, not to spoil anything, but like I'm currently working on a new show um, which is about a breakup and I keep having insecure in my mind and I am Mm. always of the opinion that sort of like, let that nigga go. I, right, I feel the same way too. <laughs> when someone breaks up with someone on a TV show, like with like the fact that Lawrence has been in every season and you continue to see this man, I'm like, I don't want to see him, you know. And it's, and it's very weird in the sense of like people do co- go in, in and out of your life when there are breakups. You know, the the, the breakup I'm interested in is Molly because like the deterioration of a friendship is more interesting to me. Uh, it feels more personal to my journey as a human being um, than, you know, sort of this like sweeping romance. Uh, and that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. And that seems to be what they're digging into this season more so. Like they seem like they wrapped up that Lawrence thing, even though like a bad ex, he's always going to pop back up. But mm-hmm. I do think that they're digging in on her and Molly's friendship. But I love the idea that this show about black women um, at its core is maybe possibly going to end with not like some type of happily ever after where you need some type of sort of man to make it that. But to just mm-hmm. be like, our friendship is our central relationship. So I'm enjoying the season. I'm loving it. Um, it's just nice seeing like the fifth season wrap up, you know, like this story that uh, Issa started, uh, even if the internet is still fighting over whether or not people <laughs> can wear AKA Lewis, people fought over uh, <laughs> Amanda <don't>. Seals' <laughs> character wearing um, the AKA colors because she's not an AKA. As if she's the first actress to ever wear AK, be an AKA, but not in real life. It's just like, girl, the Bloods didn't even give Thug Yoda this hard of a time, and they're in a literal gang. So I don't understand <laughs> <laughs> what. Every time I'm sad I didn't go to an HBCU, I'm always like, I, I have enough treachery in my life being in theater, okay? It took me right back to mine. I was like, ooh, PTSD. <laughs> Greek, <laughs> Greek culture is running the muck on black Twitter right now. But yeah, good yeah. times. So, Lewis, what have you been watching? What old movie, bitch? Well, here, okay, I, I sort of just didn't anticipate this happening, but over Halloween weekend, I mean, I guess this happens with a ton of people. I had a ton of plans and generally speaking executed them on Friday and Saturday. And then by the time Halloween came around, for, we have to put these gays out to pasture because they will just go out all fucking day. And dr- it's like days of wine and roses. They're like, sh- like drunk all day. <laughs> I was like, I am sitting at home. I am like lo- looking through my hands. I you know, I look like a character in a Bergman drama. Um, <laughs> so I just decided how am I going to uh, quote unquote comfort myself. And I realized, you know, some of my favorite movies that star Meryl Streep, I haven't seen now in like 15 years. The problem with being a movie fan is that you have to kind of like keep these balls in the air for yourself. Like a movie that you love, you may not have seen in 20 years and you're operating off that impression. So you don't even know if it's accurate anymore. So, you know, I was a different person 15 years ago, whatever. So I decided to watch two movies I have long loved, which are Kramer versus Kramer and Silkwood. Kramer versus Kramer, where she's, uh, you know, the uh, divorcee of Dustin Hoffman, who is sort of this um, white collar asshole. And she walks out on him and their kid and he she leaves him to raised the kid for about a year and a half. And then there's a, a courtroom scene, a divorce scene, where she gives a speech that Meryl Streep herself wrote. Um, and she mm. eventually won the Academy Award for uh, Best Supporting Actress. He won the Academy Award for Best Actor. Is she in the WGA? <laughs> I know. It's so weird that she hasn't done more writing because she's one of these, like, you know, for, for real brilliant people. But in this movie, they kind of acknowledge this. They say that Dustin Hoffman's character has a temper. Excuse me, he is fucking scary in this movie. And I find Dustin Hoffman routinely scary in movies. And this brings up a point I wanted to ask you guys. Do people really yell at each other in movies anymore or in real life? Well, yes, if it's a Tyler Perry movie. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of a trope of like 70s movies now where like people get into fights and like you know like scream at each other over a table and stuff it's just not how things are done anymore i wonder if it's because of things like email and being able to settle things 
not in a face to face confrontational like way or something. Texting on shows now instead of like having it out. I love arguments though because like some of my favorite scenes are like uh, you know Vanessa Williams and Soul Food being like fuck the family, the family yeah. fucked my husband, or like <laughs> Angela Bassett like being like damn you John. Like I just love. I miss that. I want more. I want more. No, and, and it's very like um, <laughs> it's very theater too, right? Like all the greatest yeah. plays have like screaming confrontations of some kind. I think that you could say that your theatrical friends, um, Lewis, still engage in that. <laughs> sure. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm saying it's possible. I, yeah. I, th- I think you've seen me in a shouting argument with someone before, okay. uh, <laughs> but it does. But it is something that feels like. It is missing. It didn't feel authentic to me in Marriage Story. I was just going to say, the one movie oh. I can think of where they had this was Marriage Story, but that itself feels like a throwback to Kramer versus Kramer. Yeah. I mean, Malcolm and Marie was long, one big, long argument. Oh, right. Well. Wow. <laughs> An argument with why I was watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Do not, do not start Ira Madison the third. And I believe you lost. I love a good yelling. I mean, it's a little toxic, but you know, I think it's good to get your emotions out. But I don't. But to your point, I don't know if there's as enough of it as there used to be. And I love that you, as a New Jersey native, Jersey girl, love that you chose to binge our Queen of New Jersey. Oh yes, Meryl right. Streep. You know, mm-hmm. wow, she has she fully taken it over from um, like Dionne Warwick, another New Jersey queen? <laughs> Mm-hmm. That's an interesting battle. Dion's got her number. Dion had been dethroned by her own niece, great niece, <laughs> yeah. her, so I think she's, you know, she'll be okay. So, how was Silkwood? Silkwood, of course, a Mike Nichols movie where uh, Meryl Streep plays like a whistleblower at a plant. Okay, I had forgotten... First of all, there's just a whole bunch of random people in this movie that you totally forget about, like David Strathairn and Diana Scarwood from Mommy Dearest is in it. Thank- we put her in a good movie. That was nice of us. And Cher giving her explosive Oscar-nominated supporting performance as uh, Karen Silkwood's uh, lesbian roommate. And I remember you see all the stories about this all the time. When her name appeared in the credits, people in the theater would laugh, like, oh, Cher's in this movie? Like, what a mm-hmm. piece of shit this must be. And then, of course, she wowed them. What a crazy moment in pop culture. Cher had been in um, Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean before that, and years and years ago in a flop called Chastity, which they she, of course, named her child after. But she, this woman just decided, I'm bored. It's 1983. What if I was, like, one of the best actors? Just, like, st- like we just kind of take it for granted now that she nailed it so hard and uh, was in subsequent great performances that decade with Mask and um, uh, Moonstruck, obviously, which she won an Oscar for. You can't forget Mermaids, etc. Suspect, I'll give you Suspect. I love Suspect, okay? I miss when most movies were like Suspect, just like a legal thriller. Unless I forget Burlesque. Ooh, you would be remiss. (laughs) (laughs) Cher is good in Burlesque. She is! She is good in Burlesque. I think we've accepted you know, um, actors um, of that caliber, like, doing that jump. There weren't really laughs in, like, um, Gaga being in Star is Born, like, the credits, because you were going to see that for her. Right, You know, she Mm -hmm. propelled herself into that, although I'm sure there'll be some laughing in House of Gucci. I am worried. I do have to say. Every new trailer (laughs) gives a new laugh for me. I cannot wait. Girl, I I mean, no, I I said this. She's making me long for the subtlety of Waluigi. Um, (laughs) I don't exactly ethical, but I'm (laughs) fast. She's deep in the spaghetti, okay? I cannot wait. Oh my god, that that accent, my eyes flew out. Anyway. <laughs> She's Miss Boyardee, okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and also, that's an interesting movie because she's surrounded by like amazing actors, right? You got your uh, Jer Irons and your Adam Driver and everybody else in that movie. But she is uh, not even giving SpaghettiOs, okay, baby. She is giving Chef Boyardee dinosaurs. It is, <laughs> it is, it is a lot. By the way, the movie is so long too, so you're getting a lot of that performance. It'd be one thing if she were like the featured, if she were like the. You know, Angelica Houston and Pritzi's Honor, where it's like she's seventh build, but has like a featured cool part. Then we could kind of like get into this. But as a leading performance, guys, I am just worried. Anyway, Ira, what are you watching? Sorry, I okay. we sort of got so, off track. Well, so I've been watching um, some some equally unhinged um, performances um, because I've been I've been I've been ca- I've been catching up with my stories. 
uh, the first um, Days of Our Lives. Is Marlena still with us? Yes. Is I'm Marlena- always watching Days of Our Lives, but Marlena, as she was in the 90s, uh, is currently possessed by the devil again. Again? <laughs> Again, this bitch stays possessed. She stays possessed. She's being brainwashed into thinking she's a serial killer like she was in 2003. Um, yeah, she's possessed again. The devil came back and, um, you know, like possessed Doug Williams on the show, who is played by Bill Hayes. Um, Bill and Susan play Doug and Julie on the show, and they've been on the show since like the 70s. And they are like in their 90s. <laughs> and Lord. they are not going anywhere uh so it's <laughs> nice to see like this actor in his 90s like you know in such a focal point of like the intro of this but like the devil possessed him confronted marlena and was like it's been 25 years marlena did you think i'd forget you and i'm shook i know some of the fans are divided because it's like you're repeating storylines from the 90s and you know it's like going into the camp uh, and like insanity, but I noticed a little of both of those here. Yeah, yeah. Days of Our Lives has always been camp <laughs> to me. Right. Now you said you've watched um, Days before, Sylvia. Yes, I was an NBC soap girl because that's what my household did. My grandparents, my babysitters, they were all in NBC soap. So I, by relation, soaked it in. I am. I feel like the life expectancy on Days of Our Lives is wild. The job security is just you know, forever. And I think it may be the only show in which the devil works harder than Kris Jenner. But what I love about, what I love about it now, or like seeing glimpses of it now, I only see, watch days now through Ira's Insta story. Like that's now where I get it from. And oh, yeah. like what I love the most about when you catch me up with days, because I feel like if you've watched dates for at least like six to seven years, you don't need much to know what's happening. Just clips here or there. And that's what your IG gives me. And it also mm. just shows me who's still there. And I'm just like, how are these people all still alive? Like they've been put in caves, dropped in ditches, you know, like shot guns mm. at each other. And they're all still cooking. Like they're just all still there. I will say that currently still there are Marlena, John, Roman, Kristen. Uh, Victor, Maggie. I feel like yes. they were all like in their 50s when I was 12. So how are they all still? Anyway, <laughs> I don't know how they're uh, all still alive, but okay. Yeah, Sammy, also, oh, Austin, the Carrie, they're all there. I would say that what I love about a soap, especially this one, it was really sad during that period where a bunch of soaps were canceled um, because now they're on the air and it feels like one of the nicest things to do to like actors because like, you have someone like John Aniston who's on the show and like his health is sort of um, gone a bit, but they use him whenever they can. And like, he doesn't really stand in scenes anymore. He's always sitting in his chair, but it's like the actors on the show are sometimes are even brought back just so they like get enough work. So like they have their SAG insurance, you know, it's like, it feels like a family, you know, mm-hmm. like it takes care of the actors. It feels like a like a community. Uh, and I love that about soaps. And that's what was saddest, you know, when stuff like uh, As the World Turns and like um, was canceled and like um, One Night to Live, All My Children. Do they invite Lisa Renna back to Days of Our Lives or is she the only yeah, one who she never came gets back. invited back? She came back. She came back. Oh, she Eileen took a David- check. I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eileen <laughs> Davidson was back. I will also say that I've been watching season three of You, um, which continues to entertain. Victoria Pedretti is that bitch, truly. When when we had, uh, was it the creator of You on this Sarah show? Sarah Gamble. Yes. Yeah, Sarah Gamble. And we were talking about her. Like it, it was all I could do not to keep talking about how fucking amazing she is. I can't even explain it. There's something so natural and not cliche ever about her. Uh huh. She's going to have a great career after this show. And what I will say, what's fun about you is the way it reinvents itself each season. This season, um, you know, you they revealed last season that Victoria Pedretti like had killed a couple people too. You know, she can, and yeah, uh, give him like, for his money, right? And then, <laughs> yeah, right. And then Joe was like, Well, I'm gonna have to kill this bitch in the season two finale. And then when he put the knife to her throat, she was like, I'm pregnant. And we were like, gotcha. Is this true? <laughs> um, and now we found out it was true, she was pregnant. And now the season is about um, them worried about whether or not they are going to like be good parents and whether their son's gonna turn out bad people like they've been in the past, trying to reinvent themselves in like uh, this like little like 
suburb area, um, which which is very like keto friendly. They're like doing a lot of um, satires of like people, like rich people, and like they're doing satires of like anti vaxxers, um, stuff like that. It's giving like Wisteria Lane, but like in 2021. Desperate Housewives <laughs> update, you know? And of course, <laughs> they still killing people. So, you wow. know, well, it was very funny when, uh, in the very opening, not to spoil so much, but it's um, their son got affected, got the measles. And they found out it was because this one um, parent was like, they don't um, vaccinate their kids. He was like, um, oh, God. you know, like we, we, the things we could put into their bodies, but at least your son's okay. And now he has immunity. And as he was turning around and leaving, she picked up. This like rolling pin and knocked him <laughs> over the head, and then they put him in a cage. And it's like, well, he deserved it. You, you had it coming. You, God, this one, this one, we understand. Yes, <laughs> rolling pin shit. By the way, always Streganona stuff. Always good. I will lastly say that this lends itself to the screen film that I've always wanted. Uh, I think that like th- this has such like a measured um, sort of um, you know examination of these two characters and how they feel as people that I still think that one day we deserve the scream film where we see it from the killer's perspective. I want to see mm. the person who's deciding I'm going to dress up as Ghostface. I'm going to be killing all these people. How are they hiding the bodies and like doing all of this? I want to see that. Okay, yeah. I, 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 I want to see how the sauce is made. But by the way, I, I, I think we would be naive to assume we won't ever get that movie because I feel like Scream is a franchise that will be re- rebooted until we're dead, for sure. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it, Michael Myers' ass is still running around chasing after his sister. It's like, ain't you tired, bitch? Also, first of all, what is he doing Hi. during any other month of the year? Is he enjoying a <laughs> national park? I want to know. Second of all. He's on the, he's the <laughs> Yeah. Like, <laughs> and Halloween kills. This man kills a bunch of firefighters in out in a yard. I'm sorry, man. You have lost your touch, girl. Where is, the, where, where is the discretion? Yes, she yeah. is. All, and she's always horrified. But he only hunts her down on Halloween, baby. Okay. If you want to kill Michael Myers, why don't you go find him on Christmas <laughs> while he's just unwrapping presents? Okay. Find him on Groundhog's Day. He's he's an unemployed man. He's right. You can just, <laughs> Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if he got a stimulus check. Yeah, right. 